The weeks one and two is what makers call the golden square. TDD, test-driven development, OOD, object-orientated design, debugging and pairing. In those first two weeks, you are learning to work together as a team. You are starting to look at working together with other developers. You're starting to learn about the proper process, the baseline that's going to help you throughout the course. I've included timestamps of these topics so you know what areas I'm going to cover and what to expect. So the curriculum is available on GitHub. As soon as you're on the full-time course, you can access this all the way through to the end to see exactly what it is that you're expected to do. As an ex-teacher, I have to say, I was very impressed with the, the, the level of richness of the tasks and the, and the use of spaced repetition to improve our process, what we're trying to achieve. With the content being all laid out in front of you, there is uh, a tendency that you have to fight against to feel that you need to try and complete everything that is there. Okay, There are, there are probably certain expectations to how far you need to get to be successful on the course, but in general, you're making yourself remember that you're trying to learn these things. You're trying to uh, take them on in such a way that you keep reflecting on them so that you'll be a better programmer than you were the day before. That's not to say that it's not difficult at times to think as it gets tough and it's, and it's tricky to, to think, oh, I must get ahead. I'm at so-and-so in my group is uh, two exercises ahead. I must finish. That won't help you. You do need to focus on the thing you're doing. And, and I have to say that the coaches are brilliant with regard to this. They do stick to this mindset and they do make sure that it's very clear that that's what the expectation is. So the tools that we've got to get better in the software environment are, to start with, uh, test-driven development. You get into unit tests. Because we work in Ruby, you'll be using a tool called RSpec. You'll create a test file and then you'll try and build up on that. So with test-driven development, what you're trying to achieve is to incrementally improve your product. Trying to start from a, a kind of a min minimum viable product, something that works, uh, and work and work forwards from there, making sure that you're, you're, you're stepping up on steady ground at all stages. So how does that work? We'll start to think about how would a user actually use this product? What are they going to do? You build these what they call user stories and to imagine what is the thing the user is trying to do and what will they expect to happen? It notice that, what, what will they want to do? What do you expect to happen? If you think in that process, then you're more likely to hit the expectations uh, that will suit what the customer needs, okay? Not necessarily what they want, but what they need. So after that, once you've got a structure, we start to design how our classes might work, uh, which we'll talk about more in object-orientated design. You, you start to imagine how that will be built up. What what things do they need? So, for example, this could be an ex something we've done with diaries and diary entries. You start to think, okay, if they have a diary, well, what will they need to do? Well, they'll need to create a, an entry for that diary. They'll want to add add that to the diary. They will want to read that diary. These are the these are the kind of things you think about, and how would that work in your code? Then let's start with unit tests. So you would start by thinking, if I only work on this one thing, this one action, I want to create a diary to, to store these things in. How does that work? What would I expect to happen? And that term expect comes up actually in aspect. You, you plan out how this will work. And at the end, you would say, I expect this thing to equal that. On the very basic level, there are more nuanced things that you do in the extension material later on, but that's the crux of it. You need to try and think what steps happen and what will I expect something to equal. Then when you build your code, it will run through that and it will test to see whether or not what you expect to happen actually does and give you feedback. Now, on a simple level, that might seem banal. Why would I do that? I can see this directly. But as your product increases in size and complexity, it's great that it, this forms two purposes. You've not just got something that tests the past things that you have built. It also acts as documentation. So other people will be able to read this and understand what you were expecting your, your work to do. Object-oriented design. I came from having practiced JavaScript and whilst this is something that is definitely present there, more often than not, you'll use a functional orientated design whereby you would just create actions that do things and you put together the things you want. Now, what I liked, there was an analogy that came up from the, the maker's curriculum that was referring to this as, as if you're creating mini universes with object oriented design. You create these objects and then and, and you design how they should act. You create methods. Uh, you say, if I, for example, I've got a diary, you, you create this mini world of what a diary represents. And you say, I this is how I create a diary. This is the actions. I want to be able to read all my diary entries. I want to be able to delete my diary entries. You decide how that mini universe works. The other term that came up is this encapsulation. And that for me was something that made it different from functional based design, is that you are making sure that everything is contained within this mini world that you've created. You can create as many of these objects as you want. You've created a blueprint 
for how they should look. Debugging itself, the term probably doesn't need too much explanation. It's the act of looking through your code when it's not working and trying to figure out what is the cause of the failure of your software. What we actually do in the course here is we start to explore some initial ways in which we would go about achieving that. So some ideas that we were told to explore were to, when you get stuck on something and you're reading through the code, to break out of it, to break it into smaller chunks. So for example, you might take um, a program that there is called IRB. You get a more of a, they call it a REPL thing, read, evaluate, print, loop. So you're able to place some, replicate some of the codes that you're having experiences with and very quickly get some feedback about how it actually works. Other things in general, we just, uh, in VS code, you've got uh, debugging. So what's great about this, and also this can be work, this can work in IRB as well, we were shown this, where you place little holders in your code, in your file, and then you run the debugger. And what it will do, it will bring up in the sidebar where you are at in terms of your variables and what they understand, what they what they hold in their, in their memory at the moment. So you'll be able to see the output of the arrays look at those closely. Is that what you expected to get at this stage in your program? And then more obviously, it's understanding your program. You will spend a lot of time debugging. We think of coding as you're writing out the, the code. You'll actually find that that is the small part of it. You'll spend more time planning, designing it, setting up your test environment and debugging than you actually will write in the code. Pairing. Every afternoon, you're gonna be expected to pair up with a different person in your, in your cohort and work through the problems that, that, you're, that you're set on in the curriculum. Or, in all honesty, that you're told to try and work with this stuff and to work with your, your learning, be in control of that. So you need to work with people to see what do they want to achieve, what do you want to achieve, and how does that work together. You're going to find different times that people are further ahead than others, and that will switch around what way that is, how does that dynamic work for you. You have to start to think about different learning styles. Bear in mind, we've all come from different places, um, different working environments, and we've got different experiences as to what you should expect from a pairing partner, from working with someone. Now, on top of that, let's just throw into that that this isn't just your two software developers, your two new software developers trying to learn what to do. You're in a you're in an environment where you're going to feel slightly pressured, and you're going to be, and you're also going to feel slightly worried about your how much knowledge you have and how that works with with your partner. It's going to be really important to to try and be careful with how you approach that. The course does address this. There, there are sessions to help you work through how that might look. There's a very long video that goes through exactly how two experienced developers took on pair programming. But it's also worth bearing in mind that there's many ways that you can approach this. What you're given are guidelines and you need to explore with your partner, different each time, what, what expectations you have and what you want to get out of this. So it was just a quick overview of the things that you will be doing for in the first two weeks of Makers. I will be aiming to create more videos on the pairing process uh, and how that evolves for me during during my time at Makers. And I'll also go through where I am at currently, having done the first two weeks, utilizing test-driven development and the object-oriented design to create a solution for a problem from start to finish. It might be a long one and I might need to break that problem down into smaller bits, but if that's something that interests you, then do, do, do check out my other videos to see how that might work.